Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Your hosts are Joseph and Madison Whalen, a father and daughter team making their way through the challenges of the teenage years. Welcome to Insights into Teens. This is episode 182. Adolescent Idealism. I am your host, Joseph Whalen, and my generous and kind co-host, Madison Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, Maddie? I'm all right. How about you? I'm doing okay. You're you a little uptight here. You want to want to talk about that real quick before we get into this? Uh, just this game I've been playing, and I have to restart the exact same battle over and over. I've had to do it at least six times today, in fact, because it's so difficult, so. And just for an honorable mention, what game is that? Baldur's Gate 3. Which we probably will be talking about on an f- upcoming episode of Insights into Entertainment, just as a little teaser there. Well, you will. I'm not. Well, no. Yeah, I'll, I'll be on the show with uh, Sam for that one. Um, other than that, how are things going? How's school going? Anything exciting? Not really. Just starting to ease into the second marking period, so. Ease into it, huh? Well, not exactly ease into <laughs> it, I guess, because. It's all relative, right? All relative, I suppose. Okay, well, hopefully it goes uh, smoother than the first marking period. Is that safe to say? I don't know, because the first marking period is supposed to be the easier one, and then it just progressively gets harder afterwards, so it's like... Just goes downhill from there. Don't really have high hopes for it. (laughs) Okay, well, on that note, what we are talking about today is teen or adolescent idealism. Adolescent idealism is a normal phase of teenage development characterized by strong views and opinions of society and the world. Typically developed between the ages of 11 and 16, which you just came out of, Mm -hmm. adolescent idealism is one of the stages of cognitive developmental theory. Adolescent idealism can impact mental health when teens discover the issues they care about aren't centered or prioritized. Treatment can help strengthen family connections and address mental health concerns associated with adolescent idealism including grief, depression, anxiety, anger, and hopelessness. And if that doesn't sound like fun to talk about, I don't know what does. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But before we get into that, I do want to take a moment to um, implore our listening and viewing audience to subscribe to the podcast if you don't already do so. You can find audio versions of this podcast listed as Insights into Teens, where you can find audio and video versions of all the network's podcasts listed as insights into things. And we can be found anywhere you get a podcast these days. Uh, though we do tend to direct people to Apple podcasts, but that's just kind of a default thing. I would also invite you to write in or contact us. Give us your feedback. Tell us how we're doing. Give us topics you'd like us to discuss. You can reach us via email at comments at insightsintothings.com. We're available on Twitter or X at insights underscore things, where you can get links to all those and more on our website at www.insightsintothings.com. Are we ready? Sure. Here we go. So we once again tap our friends at the Newport Academy for inspiration on this topic. They tell us that navigating the teenage years can be an extraordinary journey for both teens and their parents. Boy, isn't that the truth? (laughs) It's a time marked by a series of developmental milestones that shape young people into the adults they will become. Among these, 
adolescent idealism stands out as a particularly influential phase. During this stage, teens begin to see beyond their immediate surroundings and look at the world with fresh eyes. They start to form their own values, shape their understanding of the world, and discover the power of their own voices. This idealism is a vibrant force that drives them to have strong opinions on global and social issues, enabling them to think abstractly about problems and potential solutions. It's a time when their thoughts and conversations may turn to activism and advocacy as they express their views more openly. However, this expression of newfound perspectives can sometimes lead to friction. As teens articulate their opinions with growing confidence, they may find themselves in disagreement with parents, peers, and other authorities who have long-established views. These clashes are a natural part of the journey, as each side learns to understand and respect the other's perspective. It's essential to recognize the importance of this developmental phase. It provides teens with a crucial opportunity to voice their concerns, debate important matters, and begin to understand the complexities of the world they are are about to inherit. For those around them, it offers a chance to guide, support, and engage in meaningful dialogue. As families navigate these years, patience, open communication, and empathy are key. By acknowledging and supporting this stage of idealism, we pave the way for a generation of thoughtful, engaged young adults ready to contribute to society. Do you think you've gone through your idealism stage, your activism stage? Do you think you're in the middle of it? Do you think it's, it's coming up? How active do you think it is? Honestly, I do think I'm still kind of in the midst of it. Um, I know we kind of had like a generic age range and that I'm technically past that. However, I still feel like I'm still, you know, forming my own opinions and I'm still like working through that part of my life right now. Uh, You know, I still have thoughts about it. I still have to kind of form my own uh, opinion and view of everything. So I feel like I'm still kind of in it right now. So the study does talk about kind of a prescribed age, and and you're kind of at an age where many are just discovering the snooze button. Uh, But it sounds like you're already pressing the buzzer on global issues. Can you share any aha moments when you realize your voice could be more of a force for change and maybe a time that voice led to a mom you just don't understand, or in this case, probably a dad you don't understand conversation? Yeah, I have actually had a few of them. Uh, One interesting thing uh, I do want to share was when I ended up doing uh, Hobie. Uh, That was a point where uh, basically sophomores of our schools would, well, the summer of our sophomore year, we would go uh, to this like place up in North Jersey. It was Drew University. And we basically go there and we would basically um, meet with all other kids and sophomores from all different schools from around New Jersey. And we basically like saw there were public speakers there that basically, you know, gave us more influential stuff. And it was basically like a whole like leadership program. And one distinct thing that I remember was that this one speaker who I think was one of the first speakers that ended up coming up, uh, basically talked about the importance of Uh, youth and their intelligence and even commented that the youth are probably smarter than most of the adults today. Um, And basically he said that don't listen to anybody who says that, oh, you're too young to be thinking this sort of stuff or, oh, you uh, can't be saying that because you're just a kid. He basically said that, no, I think that you guys are smarter than I am. So, you know, you guys have the power to actually change the world. And, you know, I think that was one of the most, the, like, big aha moment for me, at least. Or at least it was something that was like, oh. Yeah, and I and I agree with that 100%. I mean, the article goes, to, goes on to say that this is the world you're going to inherit. So, really, you need to start making decisions now. You need to, to, to play an active role. And, you know, with the passion of youth comes great debates over the dinner table and you're no different. We're no different than that. What was the most memorable debate club session you've had with 
mommy and daddy or friends? And how did it keep you, how did it help you see the world through the vintage eyes? How, how did, how did it help you see the world through the eyes of somebody who is, I'll say, more experienced? Hmm. Um, I guess maybe it was, we've had various talks to the point that I don't even know if I can really pinpoint any specific conversation that we have. Um, however, there are certain topics that we ended up discussing that, while obviously we share very similar opinions when it comes to certain matters, there are other things where you certainly have a different opinion than I do or you see something a certain way as opposed to how I see it. Okay. I, I think that's fair. And I think, I think that's important. I think if we agreed on everything, we'd never learn to have that, that discussion with someone who has an opposing point of view. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about adolescent idealism. So what exactly is adolescent idealism? In the unique tapestry of teenage development, a pattern of idealism often emerges, vivid and compelling. It's a, it's a belief that teenagers not only have the ability, but also the right to express their opinions on various societal structures, be it in the realm of politics, religion, or any other institution. This is a time when thinking shifts from the, ta from the tangible and immediate to the abstract and the far-reaching. As this abstract thinking takes root, teenagers start to notice global issues with sharper clarity. They begin to question the actions and decisions of adult leaders, developing a keen sense of moral judgment. This is not just a phase. It's a powerful awakening that shapes their understanding of justice and fairness. However, the journey of adolescent idealism isn't without its hurdles. In environments where such views are not encouraged or prioritized, teens may find themselves at odds with the status quo. This can strain relationships and impact their mental health as they navigate spaces that may seem indifferent to their burgeoning ideals. Consider the teenager who organizes a school protest, or the one who joins a march to amplify their voice on issues they care about. Or think of the young person who decides to become vegan not just as a dietary choice, but as a stand against environmental degradation. Some may take a bold stance against systemic issues, like challenging school curricula that they believe perpetuate racism, and vow to drive change through organized protests. These are more than actions. They are statements, a declaration of the world as they believe it should be. The fire of adolescent idealism is fueled by a desire for change and a better future. It's essential for adults to understand, respect, and constructively engage with these passionate young minds. By doing so, they can help guide their idealism into lasting positive impact. So imagine you just staged a protest at school. And I could see you doing You probably can't because you're not that outgoing. But you're passionate enough to do it, I think. And probably not a big one, maybe a small one. But you've just staged a protest at school and suddenly you're handed a megaphone with the whole world listening. What's the first issue you'd address and how would you convince the adult world to take you and your fellow teen idealists seriously? Mm. Yeah, that's a big one because there's a lot of issues I would stand for completely and I'd, you know, want to address first. However, relating to the idea of having the adult world listen to the teens, I'd probably want to address the issue of people, or at least the government control over uh, how what schools should be teaching. Um, and while personally I'm not experiencing it all that much in New Jersey, I know in a lot of other states, that's a huge issue with the idea that like, oh, kids can't handle certain topics. And, you know, I feel like a lot of adults are of the belief that, oh, they're just teens. They're just kids. They don't know any better. They don't they can't really like debate with us well. And I know a lot of people like, you know, are kind of trying to tell us that w like there's a lot of people just discouraging us from 
voting, from speaking, you know, our beliefs and from really just trying for us to try and change the world. They want to stop any effort we have for that. So I'd want to address the issue that like, no, we know all the stuff that's happening and we want to bring change about it. We like can understand these topics. We're emotionally mature enough for that kind of stuff. And we're not just kids. Okay. Well, you made to that. I would certainly listen to an argument when you put it in terms like that. Now, imagine for a moment your idealism is a superhero. What would a superpower be and what's the kryptonite, the, the weakness that really tests its strength in the everyday world? Mm, superpower. Mm, that's interesting. My superpower is I can shout louder than other people. <laughs> <laughs> that's understandable. I can see how that would be useful. If my idealism were a superhero and had a superpower and also kryptonite, let's see. Um, well, I would think that my superpower could kind of materialize almost any object by thinking about it. Because I feel like in terms of, in or, in terms of, changing the world there's certain things that might be needed for certain instances and i feel like that would be a useful enough superpower to be like oh you need something in order to like protest or you need something in order to change the world here you go okay so you're a you're a provider when it comes to your uh your activism then yeah, I feel like that would be the most practical use for it. And I don't necessarily want things like mind manipulation because that kind of is an unwilling sort of thing. So. Yeah, that's a segment of the population that's probably already using that too much already. The kryptonite for my idealism um, would probably be those louder voices. Um, I feel like they could, in a way be weakened by it and i understand the idea of like actions speak louder than words or sticks and stones might break my bones but words can never hurt me words can hurt though well if you write a word on the two by four and hit you with it it's gonna hurt right? well <laughs> that's true that is true um but yeah i can see that kind of being a weakness but i can also see them eventually overcoming it in a way okay that makes a lot of sense so we're going to take our first break, and when we come back, you're going to tell us about adolescent idealism and the connection to mental health. We'll be right back. For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Welcome back to Insights and Teens. Today we're talking about adolescent idealism. And now we're going to talk about the connection between adolescent idealism and mental health. Adolescent idealism is like a powerful lens through which teenagers view the world. It's a natural and common phase of growth that can influence their choices and spark a desire to question and challenge the norms around them. This idealism is a vibrant force that drives many teens to stand up for what they believe to be just and virtuous. However, as teens grapple with the complexities of of the world, they may also discover that creating positive change is often a tangled and difficult process. This realization can be heavy, sometimes leading to feelings of sadness, anxiety, or even a sense of helplessness when the world doesn't change as quickly as they'd like. 
During this intense time of development, it's not uncommon for teens to experience inner conflict. They might find themselves wrestling with their choices, trying to ensure they align with their newfound values. When there's a gap between what they value and what they see or do, it can cause discomfort known as cognitive dissonance. This internal struggle often doesn't stay internal. It can spill over into their relationships, leading to disagreements with friends, family members, teachers, or other authority figures who may have differing views. Navigating adolescent idealism requires a delicate balance. It's important for teens to explore and express their values, but also to learn how to cope with the emotional turbulence that can come with this phase. For parents and adults, offering a listening ear, understanding, and guidance can make a significant difference. It's about supporting teens as they learn to harmonize their idealism with the realities of the world and helping them channel their passion into actions that are both meaningful and manageable. And I'd also add there constructive. You want to make sure that that passion itself goes into something constructive, not destructive moving forward. So if you could give your idealism a status update on social media, what would it say and which emoji would best capture the roller coaster of taking on the world's heavyweight issues at your age? Um, so a status update is just like updating your info on like a social just a, media. Just right? a one word or, or, or a couple word phrase of gone shopping. Mm. All right. If I could give them a status update. Um... Um, I guess I would stay, say, I'm still standing. That's good. I like that. A Billy Joel reference. Oh, no, Elton, Elton John, John reference. I'm going to say that's an Elton John reference. I heard it at a Billy Joel concert, though. It <laughs> must have been when the two of them were playing together. Maybe. <laughs> um, and which emoji would best capture the roller coaster of it, of taking on the world at my age? Um, I guess a roller coaster. Okay, I, I can't argue with that. <laughs> so as you navigate the high seas of teenage values, have you ever found yourself in hot water for your beliefs? Like with other people or with myself? Anybody. If, has, have, have, have your values or your beliefs ever gotten you into trouble or gotten someone mad at you? Uh, I don't think it was ever something that extreme. I do know that, like, I've had instances where people have probably disagreed with me. Okay. Um. I mean, like, I can certainly, if I was interacting with, like, certain people, I could certainly see myself getting in hot water. Although, I don't really think I've gotten into hot water with anybody or gotten on anyone's like radar i suppose now let me let me ask you a follow-up question do you deliberately avoid people that are of a differing opinion or differing mindset actively to prevent any type of conflict or anything from happening <sighs> kind of not really but Sort of, yeah. So I, you're somewhat anti-confrontational then? I'm not the most confrontational person, I will admit. I've never really... Whenever I've had a debate with somebody, it's usually been someone who was of a similar belief or had, like, slightly differing opinions from me. It's never been... I never really... I've never really interacted with someone on the extreme end of what I was against. Okay. Have you ever actually deliberately taken a side in a conversation or a debate that is diametrically opposed to what your fundamental beliefs are? Not really. Um, like I I'm kind of a sympathizer. I'll be completely honest. Uh, we actually had this interesting thing happen in uh, history where we were basically given statements and we were supposed to stand on one side of the room if we agreed with it or disagreed with it. And you stood in the middle. Yes, I stood in the middle. <laughs> uh, on all three of the ones we did, I stood in the middle. Okay. 
because I really thought, because, you know, whatever the statement was, I'm like, it depends on the circumstance. Well, and you know what? There's the world is filled with people like me who relish in the idea of poking a stick in, in the opposing side's point of view and, and trying to rile people up. Because one of the things that I try to do is I have my own beliefs and I don't preach my beliefs. I don't get out there and pontificate. And all I ask is other people don't do that to me. And when you do, that's when I get confrontational. That's when I'm going to poke a stick in your cage and you're going to come to me and regardless of what it's about, you know, it could be politics, religion, or, you know, anything. If you're going to come out and make a statement to me and try to get me to, to see your point of view, I'm going to challenge you. And nine times out of 10, I'm probably going to destroy your point of view because you, you can't stand up against, you know, the, the logic and, and I'll throw the controversial word science out there. Right. So, so when I ask people to provide facts and cite the sources, of their facts, that's usually when their argument falls apart. And if I can do it in return, they don't really have a comeback. And that's when they usually, the conversation tends to degrade into insults and arguing at that point. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like, I like to kind of be in the middle of most things. I certainly have my own strong beliefs, but I've gotten to a point where it's like, I want to try and see both sides and I don't necessarily want to have to go to one side over the other. And the thing is, if you have a reasonable argument for something that I don't necessarily agree with, I will listen to you and, you know, I will debate with you in a, you know, civilized manner. But if you don't provide enough evidence for it or you, you know, go to things like insults in order to just say like, oh, I'm right because you suck or something. It's like, at that point, I can't, it, it, there's no point in trying to reasonably argue with you because I don't think I, I think we kind of passed the point of an actual civilized debate. Right. And I'm with you. Like, I want to be convinced. I may have my point of view and I have my reasons for it. And if you've got a different point of view, I'm open and willing to listen and have you convince me and bring me over to your side. And I've I've done this. I used to I don't do it all that much anymore, but I would do it on Twitter or X or whatever it's called now. I would go out there and I would, it sounds kind of childish, but I'd pick a fight with, with extremists of one ilk or another. And there are plenty of times where I've had these discussions with people, and I don't want to call them arguments, they're discussions, where they've brought me to their side to actually understand their point of view, which is why I asked you if you'd ever argue the opposite of, of what your principles are. And I find that to be very educational and enlightening to do that to kind of put yourself in somebody else's shoes yeah that's the thing i don't really use social media so i can't really yeah, no i understand i understand it's not certainly not for everyone i wouldn't encourage it either and i don't really like to do it in person either because i feel like that would just well, it's nobody not gets my thing together in social media in person i can tell you that right I, now i know it's like i feel like it would be easier for me on social media because i'm not a confrontational person in real life i could maybe be confrontational on social media if i actually used right it. Well, yeah, that makes sense that makes sense tell us how uh adolescent idealism impacts relationships Adolescent idealism is a bit like a new pair of glasses for teens. It changes how they see everything, from their closest relationships to the world at large. With these new lenses, teens often develop strong opinions and a keen sense of justice. They may adopt a firm stances on issues, convinced of their views, which can lead to disagreements with friends and heated debates with adults. This stage of life can be tricky. Teens' outspokenness and willingness to challenge authority can sometimes result in them being dismissed or labeled as troublemakers. When they question life's various aspects, including adults' perspectives, it can cause frustration on both sides. Teachers might struggle with students who critique the cur curriculum, or parents who critique it like I do. While parents might be concerned about what they see as a rebellious behavior, the world doesn't always respond to idealism with open arms, and this disconnect can spark frequent arguments between teens and adults. Teens, driven, uh, 
uh, oh, I lost my, there it is. Teens driven by idealism may often feel that nobody really gets them, which can lead to feelings of anger or a sense of righteousness. Their convictions are strong, but they may not always align with the complexities of how society addresses certain issues, leading to tensions in their interactions with others. Understanding adolescent idealism means recognizing that this is a natural part of growing up. It's a phase where support and open communication are vital. For parents and educators, it's about providing the space for teens to express themselves while guiding them to navigate their relationships and the world's realities with empathy and resilience. So, if adolescent idealism is like a new pair of glasses, what's something you've seen through them that make you go, wow, I never noticed that before? Um... I guess a lot of the, like, injustices in the world, I suppose, and, like, stuff that feels like at this point we shouldn't be happening, but stuff that still is happening. Okay. Um, I certainly, I never really knew about a lot of topics until I became, until my idealism phase, and that was kind of when I learned more about how, like, I learned about like different things that people fought for and different reasons for why they fought for them and the various injustices that still happened in our world, despite the fact that we really should be past that point. So uh, it sounds like, and then based on the discussions that we've had, certainly over the, the dinner table, that you're kind of in the debate team phase of, of teenhood where every topic could spark a lively discussion. Can you share a funny story when a debate with adults turned into a, wait, are you really arguing about this type moment? <laughs> yeah, um, none of them are really serious, but I do remember there was this one time we were at like Buffalo Wild Wings and there was some sort of commercial with like a vacuum cleaner and it was going on for like a really long time. And I remember you and I like debated about it for a while and for some reason I was like questioning it so much and like then you even like encouraged it and like we were still going back and forth for a while. And by the time the food got there, we were like, Wait a minute, why were we arguing about this? <laughs> <laughs> nice. Nice. That's always a fun one. So with your idealism glasses on, excuse me, a frog in my throat there. Have you ever caught a glimpse of something that made you think, this is not what the brochure promised? Hmm. Um, hmm. With my idealism glasses on, what if I caught a glimpse of uh hmm. i hmm i guess oh jeez <laughs> if they were easy questions i wouldn't ask them yeah that's true and that's understandable um is there let me ask it this way is there anything that you've seen in this idealism phase of your life that has completely changed the way you used to look at something previous to that point in your life? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, a lot, I just can't uh, tell no, you what it is. I'm sorry. I'm, <laughs> there's a lot, all right? There's a lot. And it's some of it's kind of harder to put in broad words, but... I think one that kind of made me change my entire perspective on the world uh, was probably learning about the queer community. I'm okay. not going to lie. Like, I never really had that knowledge before. Like, you n you and mommy never hid it from me. And, like, I had seen some stuff when I was younger, kind of. Not entirely. But, like, you never hid it from me, but you never explicitly explained it. Well, in all honesty, I, I, I never brought it up because... I was completely, you know, in the unknown section there. It was it was always something that was kind of a distant thing to me. So I was certainly not uh, the subject matter expert to, to broach a subject with you that I did not have an understanding of myself. That's true. Uh, but when I actually, you know, found out about it and would even find out that there was even more than I had originally thought there were, it's like, Wow, I think my entire point of view has just completely changed. Wow, mind blown. 
Yeah, because, like, here's the thing. When I was younger, I initially had the idea of, like, being the princess that would eventually meet a prince. I don't know where you would have ever gotten that notion from. (laughs) Disney. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so... For a while, I kind of had that belief that I'd eventually find, like, my Prince Charming or whatever. And then I found out about this and learned more about how, oh, romantic relationships are actually a lot more complicated than you would have thought. And I'm like, okay, reality check. Yeah, yeah. It's one of those things where you you go through life with a black and white TV and then all of a sudden you've got color. Pretty much. And it's almost like. How did I ever see the world in black and white? Yeah, and that's what I, that's one of the things I'm going through. It's like I look back at my younger self and how, you know, I initially thought this sort of thing. And I'm like, how did I ever think that that was going to work? Yeah. Well, and you know what? Kudos to you for not only recognizing that, but embracing it. Because there are some people who go through life with a black and white TV. They get, they're given a brand new full color TV and they just can't handle the colors and they go back to watching their black and white TV. Yeah. Kudos to you for having the, the presence of mind to embrace what you did get enlightened with. Um, I think that's a good spot. We can take a quick break and come back and we're going to talk about. Uh, how to address adolescent idealism and hopefully help help our parents out there deal with it. Not deal with it, but certainly help their kids get through it and, and nurture that sense with them. But we'll be right back. Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. Welcome back to Insights in the Teen. Today we're talking about adolescent idealism. And now we're going to talk about how to address adolescent idealism. Uh, we're saying that a lot today. Yes, we got a we commission every time we say it. Yep. When young people hit their teen years, they often start to see the world through a new lens of idealism and opinionated perspectives. This can be quite a shift for parents and caregivers to handle, but there are effective ways to support teens during this critical stage of cognitive development. Firstly, it's key to really listen to what they're saying. When teens talk about issues that matter to them, like vegetarianism, taking the time to understand and show genuine interest can strengthen your bond. If it's something you can do, adding a vegetarian option at mealtimes shows support for their choices. Validation goes a long way. Acknowledging their feelings and views makes them feel seen and respected. Recounting your own youthful experiences of challenging the status quo can bridge gaps, helping your teen feel a sense of shared experience and less isolation. Nuance is also an important concept to introduce. Encouraging teens to see the good in people they may disagree with helps them grasp that the world isn't black and white. Introducing them to books or podcasts can expand their perspectives, fostering empathy and understanding. The foundation of your relationship with your teen could be... Sorry, I'm going to try that again. The foundation of your relationship with your teen should be unconditional love and support. They need to know that you're in their corner, ready to listen and take them seriously. 
Instead of discounting their idealistic views, nurture their enthusiasm and guide them towards expressing their ideas with tact and respect. Lastly, educating yourself about adolescent development and the issues your teen is passionate about can be incredibly beneficial. It's it not all. This not only shows that you're slow down. <laughs> I need to relax. This not only shows your teen that you care, but also equips you to help them find constructive ways to channel their activism, demonstrating that their voice is powerful and can contribute positively to the community. Can empower them to make a meaningful impact. So, as you navigate through your teen years with this new lens of idealism. How do you reconcile the passion of your convictions with the complexities of the world that sometimes doesn't align with your perspectives? Um, all right, so. It's a good thing I wrote the questions down, huh? Yeah, this is another one that, could you say it differently, please? It's a bit much for me to read and I don't entirely understand So it. how do you reconcile your feelings and your passions with reality when they don't necessarily meet like like you may see things one way and the world may see it differently or a large segment of the population may see it differently how do you reconcile that is that a conflict for you is that an avoidance for you is that somebody out there who has a difference of opinion that you might be able to make see reason from your perspective that's the thing. A lot of the times I'm kind of more of the avoided person, although I do think that I could if I, you know, tried more and was a little, you know, braver with everything. I do feel like I could at least debate with people um, who don't exactly see uh, my perspective. And, you know, we could maybe find some sort of compromise or maybe at least get to a point to agree to disagree. Um, Do you see that there's a value in that, though? There is, is there a value in taking somebody who may think differently about a, a subject and, and pick pick a subject? You know, it doesn't matter. Abortion, okay? So let's – you have one view, and we're not even going to discuss what the view is. There's two sides to the abortion debate. Mm -hmm. Is there value – do you perceive value in discussing your point of view with someone else? If there's a chance that maybe you can bring them around to your line of thinking, or does that not even matter to you? The thing is, I don't want to, like, force people to change. However, well, convincing, well, people convincing people is not people. forcing Fair them. enough, yeah. So, yeah, if I could convince somebody to see reason, I feel like, you know, that is beneficial. And I don't want to, like assume that my own view is, you know, the best view on a certain topic, especially, you know, more controversial topics. However, you know, I do think that if I could, you know, convince someone, I could maybe possibly see that I am, you know, gaining, I don't know, I feel like it could be beneficial in a couple of different ways. Well, and that's why it's important to look at these discussions as discussions or debates, not as arguments. Yeah. Arguments, you're trying to force somebody's hand or force somebody's thought. Yeah. But in a discussion or in a debate, you present your case. You present your supporting evidence, whatever facts that you have. The other person has to weigh that. Now, they may come back with counterpoints that try to poke a hole in your idea, but you have a chance to overcome those as well. So when you have these types of discussion, you have to be as open-minded to and receptive of their thoughts and opinions as you want them to be to yours. Yeah, and I feel like that would be the most beneficial way of going about it because not only would they hopefully be open-minded to whatever I'm saying, I'll be open-minded to whatever that they're whatever they're saying. And I feel like that would be beneficial for both sides. And and the thing to keep in mind is there's two sides to the abortion debate. There's two very clear sides to it, just like there are to gun control and, and whatever else. But there's a lot of different levels on each of those sides. Yep. So if, for instance, you have someone who's just diametrically opposed to your point of view, 
and you can sit down and have a logical discussion with them, present your case, and not plant the seed of doubt, but at least make them see it from your perspective. Maybe, just maybe, you might be able to make them be a little bit more sympathetic and a little less unrealistic in their point of view if they're if they're fanatical about their point of view. Yeah. And that's where compromise starts. That's where you can start working on compromise and meet somewhere in the middle. And that's really what what makes the world a better place. It's not my way or your way. It's somewhere in the middle. And and if your ability to have those discussions to people can start moving them down to that middle ground, that that ground of rationalism, then that's how we make the world a better place. It's not about convincing them of our perspective because, like you said, we aren't saying that our perspective or our opinion is the way of the world, but if I can soften up the other guy's point of view to at least be receptive, then I then he can be more receptive on other things or she can be more receptive on other things too. Yeah. And if we if we come back in from that left and that right extreme side, we come back into that middle ground there. We can cooperate on things and we can make things a little bit more better for the for the rest of the world. Yeah, the idea of at least just getting away from extremism, I think is at least the best way we should be going about things. So in discussions with parents and caregivers, how do you find common ground when viewpoints do clash, especially on topics you feel strongly about, like politics or social justice? Well, if uh, we've ever had to, you know, clash with certain issues, um, usually I will present my case and why I believe um, certain things. And then whatever other family member that disagreed with me would, you know, present their case. Uh, and I feel like through that sort of thing, we can still find some sort of compromise, usually something that we can agree, up agree upon. We'll basically, like, try to go back and forth uh, between us in the discussion until we reach a point that we can both at least kind of agree on. Okay. And, and that's how the process is supposed to work. It's, it's common ground. One last question. And then we'll take a quick break and come back with your closing thoughts. So looking forward, how do you envision channeling your current ideals and passions into actions that will positively shape your community and the wider world? Well, I think I want to take a larger stance when it comes to activism, or at least in a way, try to do more. I have all these ideas and passions, but I don't always utilize them. I understand I'm not really the most social person out there, and it might be a little more difficult for someone like me to go out there and make a stance. But uh, I do want to try and take more action, because even if, you know, we do the podcast and I talk about wanting to do all the good stuff, I want to actually do things that will be beneficial, will help, will show my activism, rather than just saying, I support these topics. Well, and you never know. The passion that you have for your activism might be the thing that unlocks that that innate uh, hesitation to go out there and speak with people more directly. You never know. Yeah. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, come back. We'll get your closing thoughts and finish up with the business of the podcast. We'll be right back. All right. So to everybody out there, I just want to say that uh, adolescent idealism is a pivotal point in teens' lives as it pretty much will eventually shape them into the person that they're going to be when they become adults and how they view the world and what they're going to do with it. And I feel that to the parents out there, the best way to, you know, cope with a teen that is very expressive in their ideas is to at least support them. Even if you don't support their arguments or you don't uh, really have the same beliefs as them, the idea of at least it's supporting this 
uh, stage in their life instead of just saying, oh, you're just a kid. You can't be thinking that kind of thing, those kind of things or, oh, you're just a kid. That's you shouldn't be worrying about that sort of thing. I feel like we should at least be encouraging that sort of thing because teens are very smart and teens do have these ideas. And I think we kind of need to stop treating it as like, oh, it's just a kid being rebellious or it's just the point where it's like, oh, the kid just doesn't understand or something. Amen to that. I couldn't agree with that more. I think I think it's important that the, the understand, you know, people my age need to understand that tomorrow's in your hands. It, it may sound overwhelming at times when people say yeah. stuff like that, but if they don't start getting you ready for it now, it's going to be dropped in your lap and, and you're not going to know what to do with it. Yeah, and that's kind of what I've had to deal with at this point. It's like I'm literally one year away from being considered a legal adult in my country. And it's like I'm terrified. Like I, I'm certainly I feel like I might be more prepared than other people, but I'm still terrified. And I can't imagine the idea of parents still wanting to restrict their kids at my age from seeing certain things about the world. And it's like, when I actually become an adult and you can't do that, what am I going to do? It's our job as parents to to prepare our kids to inherit the world, like the article said. I couldn't agree more. So that's all we had today. Before we do go, I want to once again implore our listening and viewing audience to subscribe to the podcast. Audio versions of this podcast can be found listed as Insights into Things, and audio and video versions of all the network's podcasts can be found as Insights into Things. We're available on on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, iHeartRadio, Buzzsprout, etc. I would also invite you to write in, give us your thoughts, give us your feedback. Email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. Check us out on Twitter. We stream five days a week at Twitter. No, we don't stream on Twitter five days a week. But we are on Twitter or X at insights underscore things. On Twitch, we stream five days a week at twitch.com slash insights into things. Uh, We're also on Instagram at instagram.com slash insights into things. We can get links to that and much more on our official website at insights into things.com. And you. And don't forget to check out our other two podcasts, Incense and Entertainment, hosted by you and mommy for now. And Incense and the Tomorrow, our monthly podcast, not really anymore, though. Normally hosted by you and my brother Sam, although that's probably changing soon anyway. Boy, and if that's not a confusing plug, I don't know what is. Hey, I'm not the best at advertising again. <laughs> Clearly. Whatever. Uh, that's it, folks. Another one in the books. Bye, everyone. Bye.